Everybody, I'm super excited to have Franco Cavallari here. There's so much for us to talk about. He was 1992 North American champ of IFBB Weeder Pro, right? Did I say that right? Well, it's a, yeah, it's a bodybuilding show that qualifies you for pro status, yes. Nice. He's in his PhD C, about to get his certificates in September. We've got a lot to go over, mostly having to do with nutraceuticals and his story of how he got to the point that he got to and many different aspects of his life. Welcome, Franco. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So could you take us back to the beginning? Like, let's talk bodybuilding days. I know you were talking about dealing with ulcerative colitis. And I know there's a really interesting story there. Yeah, it is it is a quite an amazing journey. I mean, we've all had amazing journeys in different ways. Um, you know, I started in athletics as a as a soccer player, a young soccer player looking to build a little bit more strength. So started working out and, and, um, my body responded quite well to the weight training and the strength training. So eventually that began a new direction for me in terms of sports and, and personal development, because, you know, anytime you find a groove where you're passionate, excited and seeing results, it begins to develop and shape you beyond the, the activity itself. And then you got into bodybuilding. Yeah, I started competing. I, I, after high school, went straight into University of British Columbia. I did my undergrad uh, in human nutrition and biochemistry. And uh, while doing my undergrad, um, climbed the ladder in the bodybuilding arena. So I became kind of a, it was a, a we, we kind of call it a dual picture, you know, polarized when bodybuilder training with high discipline and the academic, you know, studying with high discipline. And was there carryover what you were learning in school and then what you could use in the bodybuilding world? Absolutely. I mean, really, the fundamentals are discipline and and believing in your capacity to achieve. I mean, those can be applied at, at any, anything you, you, you attempt to accomplish. But um, I became, became my own guinea pig because studying human nutrition, ultimately, um, the, the impetus for that was to study human performance. And at the time, it was all about physical performance. Mm -hmm. So I began to study my own blood work, uh, work with professors and people in, in the field of uh, kinesiology and performance to optimize my own personal development in bodybuilding originally. When was this? Was this the 80s? Yeah, I began that quest in 83. As By the time I was in grade 11, I was already competing uh, in grade 12, I competed in my first bodybuilding, uh, formal bodybuilding show, and that kind of set in motion uh, a passion to perfect. Yeah. That's not so. You you were saying that up until that point, it was all just about physical performance, and you were starting to reveal the importance of nutrition. Yeah, and I, I really had a fundamental understanding of nutrition. I used to read a lot of the um, old Joe Weider yeah. booklets. They were not quite magazines, but they were black and whites and began to learn the fundamentals. And that inspired me. And, and it inspired me to go to university to actually study the chemistry of nutrition with the original intention and objective to apply that personally and expand my capacity. But it, um, you know, that learning curve over the first five years to IFBB North American Championship form by the time you get there, you realize it's all about mindset. Mm -hmm. And so everything you've studied in, in, in the context of biochemistry begins to take a shift when you realize, you know, your human potential to morph a body into something that's, for most people, unfathomable is all about what you can fathom to begin with. Your, your ability to visualize. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and so even as, as early as grade 12, I remember in high school, visualizing my outcome, I would meditate before a training session and meditate after a training session, visualizing the outcome I was trying to achieve. And, you know, I pass this on to a lot of people that I, I mentor and in particular, my kids, visualization to manifest an expectation, you know, knowing, knowing, just absolutely knowing you can achieve that outcome. And how did you get introduced to meditation? Um, you know, at first it was almost a, a spontaneous need to, to try and capture any possible way I could optimize my own personal potential to achieve this goal. Um, and, you know, I began to come upon books 
Deepak Chopra, I remember reading some of his books on meditation, visualization. And, um, you know, that entire concept, I didn't realize the strength and the potency mm -hmm. until looking back, looking back at my journey in bodybuilding, not just the academics, but in bodybuilding, because the bodybuilding outcome is a more, you know, physically relatable outcome. And when you look back at pictures and two years later, I mean, you begin to see you're manifesting a, a, an outcome that you saw two mm -hmm. to three years before. And um, it's such a slow drive and slow increment that you, there's, there's no way you can actually see shifts within 30 days. I mean, it's 30 months that you look back and say, wow, what happened? Yeah, it's the long-term consistency. Yeah. So I know there's a big part of your story having to do with ul ulcerative colitis. Can we talk about that? Yeah, in, in 1991, I was competing. I was get, preparing for Mr. North America, and um, I became ill. I was hospitalized for um, – I, I started, started experiencing a gastrointestinal problem. And, you know, at the time, I was taking curcumin at very high doses to recover from the training. And, you know, you got, you have to um, keep in mind, the training we did was not typical. It was like the upper 0.5% of population of the human population's capacity to even, even re absorb that kind of intensity. We were squatting 700 pounds, bench pressing 500 pounds and training, you know, five to six days a week. I was up at six in the morning, two hour training session, go to school, UBC, and then after school cardio, and then study till midnight. That was my life for five years. And the potential to recover needed to be optimized. So I, I began to investigate anti-inflammatory remedies and curcumin became one. And curcumin at the time was a very crude application uh, in the context of what we see today. Herbal uh, turmeric and curcumin is extracted from this turmeric that only has about 6% curcumin in it. Once you extract it, you have this 95%. And I began to play with the 95% extract even as early as my undergrad, to optimize my recovery from training. And um, in 1991, we ran out of curcumin. And suddenly, oh, really? I blew out with this condition called severe ulcerative colitis, and I was bleeding. But the entire time that I trained for five years towards this IFBB Mr. North America, I did have this gastrointestinal gurgling, this problem. And it, lo and behold, the curcuminoids I was using in high concentration were taking the edge off it, not completely recovering me until I stopped. Mm. And that's when I became hospitalized and realized when I was hospitalized for about approximately two and a half weeks to three weeks, losing 25 pounds, that that may have been giving me the edge or taking the edge off of the disease. And so with, with the help of doctors, got out of the hospital, continued the process of extraction, isolation, and, um, got better within about three to four months. And then, you know, I won the Mr. North American championships a year later. And, and this is another challenge and stumbling block that, you know, I use as a model because it's a massive stumbling block that if you listen to convention causes you to surrender to your goals and your personal, your personal vision. Yet if you believe in your own capacity, this is just a stumbling block that shapes you and makes you stronger as you continue towards your personal goal. So you just mentioned if you listen to convention that causes you to give up. Was there any of that happening in the hospital? What were they telling you? Well, look, you know, when I, when I started bodybuilding, it was, uh, I, it was all against, it was against all odds to begin with and, and against all the people who cared about me um, or those who maybe didn't care about me, you know, um, those who cared about me is like, like, you know, one in a million make it through. Mm -hmm. But that's the point. Right. I'm, I'm the one in the million. <laughs> <laughs> in the back of my head. Yeah. You know, I would never vocalize that because that, that, you know, you'd come across egotistical, but I would voice that to myself. And, and, you know, I would, I would tell myself, I'm Mr. Olympia. I just need to work the next three to five years to go pick up my trophy. Right. And, and, and so meeting the outcome over time, over a realistic time that you bring, uh, you know, milestones in place to, to be able to direct you to that, that outcome. But 
even a challenge as profound as this ulcerative colitis, which is debilitating for most people, um, I was able to navigate with the help of conventional allopathic medicine and the compounds that I was using beyond what anybody else was able to achieve in the treatment of this condition and then in the accomplishment of the original goal despite the condition. We're going to get further into that because I'm assuming that this led you into interest into natural medicine Absolutely. therapies, which is what you're doing now. Franco is actually the formulator of the Human Garage supplementation that they use. Uh, amazing supplements for for they've got fascia fuel, fascial um, recovery, fat, like curcumin supplement. Power Kirk is what it's called. Um, so we'll get into that in a second. I do, however, want to dig a little bit more. Um, because there's a lot of people right now that are faced with a diagnosis of an illness. And when the doctors tell you, you have fill in the blank, in your case, it was severe ulcerative colitis. And that I'm assuming that hits you. Could you just take us a little bit into, so, I mean, we, you mentioned mindset, but like, what's the actual procedure that you remember that you went through from like the devastating news to I'm going to, I'm going to beat this. Oh, you know, it's, it's a, I, I mean, the exact words that still resonate from, well, I was 24 at the time mm -hmm. and is your life the way you know it is done. Right. That's, this is, yeah. that, that, that's what I heard. This is what they tell that, people. And I, and I said, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? You know, we have to take it to emergency surgery. You have to take out your large intestine now because your body's attacking it. It's an autoimmune condition. It's quite significant and quite serious. I said, okay, you know, I didn't poo poo it. I mean, it's quite serious. And I began to then absorb it. And what I knew already was I had the capacity to manifest because of my bodybuilding journey. You know, uh, few people can get under, oh, here's, and here, here's something that I can model that precisely taught me over and over again, the power of the mind. I would squat seven 45 pound plates on each side of a bar. Mm -hmm. That's over 700 pounds. Now, it's not something I would do all the time. And I have to say, it's not something I would do as an Olympic lift that was properly done, but it was a lift that was a squat to measure my own strength. Call it ego, call it whatever you want. I, I, looking back as an older, mature man, I cringe thinking, oh my gosh, like 700 pounds, that's a truckload. Mm -hmm. But there were times when I wasn't mentally ready and I couldn't even get it off the bar, right, off the rack. Right. I'd get under the rack and my body would shake and I have to slam it back on. Now you got to keep in mind, preparing for the lift in itself is a taxing event that collects everything you have spiritually, mentally, and um, cognitively and physically to get under that bar and conquer it. Because 700 pounds on your back, if you're not ready mentally, let alone physically, it's going to have you crashing down. And so just to know, I come back off, sit back down, and we would have the entire gym stop training. And not that I would call on the entire gym, but it, you know, 700 pound squat is significant right. and they would all come around and then you have the power of a group. Yeah. And that I would just completely change blood pressure, heart rate, and just shift. And the guy that walked under that bar was not the guy who started that shift. So you begin to really, really understand the power of the mind. That 700 pounds is not lifted off that rack unless the mind is ready to do it. Not the body. I'm so continue. Thank you for sharing at this level. No. I, I used to own gym. So I've, I've been through this, not at the level, but just so you guys know, 700 pounds is if you, if, if you've ever been to the gym, there's probably nobody that you've ever seen ever in your life that has lifted this amount of weight. It's probably double what the strongest person that you can imagine can lift. And so we're talking about an extreme endeavor here. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, it's almost uh, 725 pounds is almost three times my body weight. Right. <laughs> that's a good example. So yeah. take three times your body weight. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. 
And so you were able, that, that was your reality. That's actually almost four times your body weight. It's <laughs> almost four times your body weight. Gosh. Right. Yeah. Right. So that was your reality. And when the diagnosis hit you, you same, same mindset. Well, I, I sunk down and then, and then right away, my personality is analyze, analyze, analyze. Let me think about the last two years. Mm -hmm. I went back and I collected my, my training. I had a book where I actually recorded reps, weight, how mm -hmm. I felt that day when yep. I started, my general eating habits and, and the grams of protein per day I would take. And one thing I didn't record was the curcuminoid concentration I was using each day. And, and that was something I was just additive. But I began to realize, you know, this gastrointestinal problem seemed to have gotten worse when I stopped taking the curcuminoid and it just escalated out of control over about a month period of time when I stopped. And, and that's when I said, okay, look, you guys need to get me. I was literally walked out by my family. I couldn't walk. I couldn't walk that I was so weak. And, um, I had to take some corticosteroids at the time that the doctor prescribed for inflammation, prednisone. And, um, I said, look, this stuff destroys your body. So let's get the momentum going in the right direction in terms of inflammation, create the window of opportunity for recovery. And I went back to using the curcuminoid concentrations that I was extracting before. I won the Mr. North America, um, what, uh, nine months after leaving that hospital. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. So that was 30-ish years ago. I would say 32 years ago. Yeah, a long time. Right? Yeah. So what have you been doing between then and now? Well, you know, what happened was when you get to that level of bodybuilding or athletic sport, you know, you're really pushing yourself. And with a disease like that, you don't want to, things are going to break. So I said, okay, I'm going to back off. I'm not going to turn pro because I could have then. Um, I backed off and I used that platform to build a sports nutrition company called Champions Nutrition that reflected the nutritional philosophies that I had studied and applied to myself. And that company um, did amazing. It went 5,000 in sales first year by third year it was doing 5 million in sales. And the sports nutrition company was dri driven by me by going to different gyms and different locations in North America and doing seminars as Mr. North America um, and teaching some of the biochemistry. And this is interesting because I look back at the level of, of teaching, the level of scientific information I delivered. It was fundamental and everybody understood and was able to apply to achieve their goals. But when I sold that company, my real objective was I'm diving back down into the research mm -hmm. genomically mm -hmm. to understand what that curcuminoid was doing. Genomically. Genomically. Okay. Now, so in order to do that, you know, I began to leverage the, the funds that I had from the company that I had sold, but wasn't able to dive down because I didn't have the knowledge to do allopathic drug research. And what I wanted to do was take each of these curcuminoids out of that curcumin extract, determine which one was relevant to the restoration and recovery, and at least compensation or symptom um, ad adaptation and accommodation, and determine how I can deal with perfecting what I was using that I knew worked in alignment with how my mind was working. And so I began a process I literally went back to school because when I finished my undergrad, I was supposed to do my graduate studies in experimental medicine. I decided to start the company. I thought if a company goes well, I'll stay with it. If not, I go back. Well, the company went well and 18 years went by, sold the company. I went back and did my experimental medicine degree and um, started at UBC in the faculty of medicine. Oh, you can't do this. You're, you know, you got a family, all these kids are studying full time. There's no way you can compete on a bell curve. Well, I had 91% average in the medical curriculum as a mature student with a family and, you know, from a distance running my business. And then um, we had medical discoveries in the, in the field, in the brain research center. I studied at the university of British Columbia and um, published my papers uh, prepared my manuscript and dissertation, passed with with um, high standing, the comprehensive examination, which leads you then into preparation for dissertation. Everything's done. And um, lo and behold, then began another battle. And I look back, you know, and you think these battles in life, you know, you... You, 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 you can take a moment, you know, a day or two to go, okay, crap, this is terrible. Then you got to just buck up and go after it. And that was my personality. And the battle really was the university saying, hey, wait a minute. 
you don't own that technology that we just developed before you graduate with your PhD. You, we, by, we, we, the university own it, not you. Mm. And I went, wait a minute. That technology was in the field being sold to people who needed it to empower their lives five years even before I came here. And I, and I owned the technology. Now you guys are trying to take it. This is actually a common problem in the university setting. And so, you know, I said, look, I'm not your typical student. I, I know what my rights are from a legal standpoint, but more so from the ethical, moral, and, and human being standpoint. It's not going to happen your way. So that, be, that then initiated another battle that shaped a human being that I am today that is not the same human being that went in. And that is someone who realizes right and wrong and will stand for right. I don't care what the consequences are because right is right. And so that those traits then get embedded in the work you do in the future because I opened up my own pharmaceutical research organization and said, okay, I'm going to study all these technologies the way they should be studied because the allopathic pharmaceutical industry does not want to study natural medicines the way I study them, using their own principles to study them, to validate them. Because once you validate the natural compound in the context of the activity of the pharmaceutical compound, and you, you demonstrate that the efficacy is similar, if not better, without the side effects, big companies have big problems. Right. Can we talk about that? Because when you think about pharmaceuticals, it's, it's, there's side effects and there's this notion of um, not being natural. However, they're all made from natural components, right? Like at, at some point it came from nature. Well, you know, I, I don't know what the exact figure is, but I'm going to give you an, um, an estimate that between 85 and 90% a pharmaceutical agents that deliver a pharmacology that's beneficial to humanity in one form or another stems from natural compounds that originated to deliver a pharmacology that was functional. Now, on the pharmaceutical side, they may change the molecular structure to improve bioavailability, to improve target specificity. This is an important feature when it comes to pharmaceutical products that need to be targeted so that they don't have a broad activity mm -hmm. that may create uh, adverse events when it's too broad. But the broad activity is conducive to holistic pharmacology. Right. Right. You see? So I began then the quest of studying this in my own way, based on my own philosophies, because I'm hard-headed and I believe when I believe in something, I go. And so I became an island for a long time. The island was using pharmaceutical drug research principles to study holistic natural medicines and bring them into the context of activity that may be pharmaceutical-like, yet not cross over to break down the holistic application. That's not an easy concept to convey because as soon as you take a holistic compound, break it down. Now you're, you're kind of pushing it over into pharmaceutical philosophy. Mm -hmm. But what I began to do, and this started with curcumin because I needed to know what the pharmacology of curcumin was in the context of my disease. And my PhD was work, the work was based and um, um, centered on NF-kappa B signaling pathway, a pathway that's responsible for the inflammatory cascade. And each of the curcuminoids was studied in the context of that pathway to determine which one did what. Um, and so what then evolved as my research philosophy was, let's isolate each active constituent in the holistic herb, determine what each does to the genome and the proteome, and then re-engineer it to be highly specific, the constitution to be specific, to target the genes that you need to target in order to treat a disease, and then maintain the holistic activity as well by including the holistic form. So what we're doing is knowing which curcuminoid does what to the genomic activity and proteomic activity associated with disease. We'll include the whole, but we'll make sure those curcuminoids are in concentrations high enough to deliver a reliable result every time. And we do that then with other herbs. It becomes more even, even more complex with ashwagandha. Having 35 with analytes, isolate each one, map it to the genome, and you create different medicines 
that have target specificity. And so I've been to India and discussed these principles with um, Indian people who are rooted in the culture, as well as scientists who are professors in universities. And you get this polarized response. Don't you dare mess with our cultural medicines. Mm -hmm. These are rooted in three to 4,000 years. And, and, and you have to respect that because there's value in that, that culture that, that builds longevity. But if there's longevity in a herb that delivers results and it's still here for 4,000 years delivering results, there's activity in there. Right. The question is, how do we maintain standardization? And the question I had to the group of hundreds of, from professors to laymen in the, in the audience was, how do we know what the constitution of that herb was 4,000 years ago? We didn't have the tools to be able to dissect it. And today, 4,000 years later, the climate has changed, the right. earth has changed, the insects have evolved and changed. That, then the metabolites that are built within that herb are different right. than they were 4,000 years ago. This is apples and oranges. Yet today we have the scientific tools to be able to study each of those constituents and determine what each does in the co context of the polypharmacology. How's that polypharmacology, that three-dimensional pharmacology we call holistic? How is it built within that? And so when I go in and isolate each of the 35 with analytes, map the activity to the genome. Now, I cannot possibly map every activity, but I'm targeting those that involve a specific disease to take the 35 and say, okay, I'm going to deliver a 12% ashwagandha for you every time, standardized. But, but the three with analytes that target NRF, which is a transcription factor that builds and transcribes for glutathione, superoxide, dismutase, catalase. These are antioxidants inside your cell. So what I'm doing is targeting the compound that creates a robust concentration of antioxidants in your cell to help you resist disease and elevated cortisol the way ashwagandha is supposed to. But I know which withanolides are doing that. So I can standardize those within the 12 because we've mapped that out. And then we publish the papers in the medical journals, the peer-reviewed journals, so that they're reviewed by independent professionals that validate or invalidate the work we've done in that context. Just backing up here, because you, you're mentioning with analytes, curcuminoids, when people, when, when like a average person looks at curcumin, it's just curcumin. So could you just in layman's turn explain that like how it's not just curcumin, there's different aspects. Of yeah. And this is, and this is the misconception. When you buy curcumin, for instance, in a health food store, you may buy a 60% curcumin or a 95, 95 is usually quite common, 95% curcumin. And then, you know, wow, I have a concentrated product because it's all active. That's the anti-inflammatory constituent. But what people don't know is within this 95, there are three curcuminoids that make it up. And they fluctuate in proportion from batch okay. to batch. The primary one is curcumin one. And the secondary one is curcumin two, just for simplistic terms. And curcumin three is the smallest concentration. And that's typically how it's extracted. And what we do is we've said, let's go in to that 95, separate each one, then map the pharmacology. How is it working in the body to modulate activity of inflammation? And therefore then determine what's the... What's the responsibility and the activity for each individually that contribute in totality to this polypharmacology, this umbrella? And therefore, when we know that, then I say, wow, you know what? We made a discovery. Curcumin-3 inhibits a protein called MSK1. For most people, it doesn't mean anything. But that protein is escalated in a lot of autoimmune diseases like mine, a lot of conditions that are associated with cancer, things like that. If we escalate this, it changes the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory activity of the curcuminoid. If we escalate it beyond the 3% to 30, now you have something that's targeting two proteins in the cell that are responsible for escalating inflammation instead of one only. And the activity occurs and people feel it within two hours, not two days. And this is why when I was using the curcuminoids and it was taking the edge off of my disease, the dose I was using were gram doses that people don't typically use. My question to myself was, 
do I need the gram doses because it's a weak substance that requires uh, absorption because bioavailability could be a problem with curcumin 2? Or once I start determining that curcumin 3 is only in 3% concentration, mm -hmm. do I need to take more because I need more curcumin 3 to be in the total? So that became my mini quest. Let's study them individually and determine if it's by chance the higher concentration of curcumin-3 that gets into the process when I take a high dose of the overall curcumin. Sure enough, that was the discovery. Curcumin-3 has different activity than the other two. And it's additive and changes the inflammatory activity and anti-inflammatory potential of the curcumin. So then we publish the papers and patent that shift. Now, why patent it? The reason is we then begin to commercialize that to create revenue to study the next one. Right. And the revenue then goes, I hire two more PhDs downstairs. Now we're doing 35 with analyze for ashwagandha. Let's map this. It's like Columbus going out to find and map the world, but now mapping this with a better understanding of the herb to determine how we can digitize. And I call it a switch, digitize the 35 to be specific. We're now doing studies in India on cancer on a different fraction from the one that protects you from cortisol elevation. And so you can see using the allopathic research models from pharma, we're now dissecting these herbs to know, to have knowledge about how they work in the context of the genome and how it integrates into human lives to improve your ability and empower you with the tools that are na in nature and have co-evolved with us to deliver an outcome that optimizes human being. Do you sell the sell to the public? We we just manufacture product for different companies that, that okay. deliver consumer products. Great. Yeah. So Franco and I right now are on a regenerative farm in Bandera, Texas, and we're with a human garage team. Uh, kind of it's it's in the middle of Texas, and we're here all working together and humangarage.net you can find some of these products with curcumin, with ashwagandha, yes. and they're designed by Franco uh, with all of this amazing <laughs> intention into it. For me, this sounds like how pharmaceuticals should be. I mean, pharma is like from a farm, right? It's, it's pharmacology. It's, it's Yeah, and you know, the thing is that I think when we go into natural living and natural regeneration and recovery, um, you know, we have to keep in mind, you know, some people, we, people get polarized with their opinion of pharma versus nutraceutical. And there's a place for both. I mean, if we didn't have the basic antibiotic, you wouldn't be able to have a very simple surgery. I mean, you might die from a very simple infection that, that would kill people, you know, a hundred years ago. And today we're just take for granted that, you know, we were able to recover from those things. However, you know, my, my, my mission in my opinion, is that every medical practitioner should be educated in these nutraceuticals. And the only way we're going to get them to be looking at them is if, unfortunately, if we study them in the context of their own curriculum mm -hmm. to demonstrate, look, this is your principle. This is your experimental model. And look what we showed. Yeah, you're playing their game. Yeah, just, you know what? Get on the field with them. Just play it as hard as they play it. Yeah. And are you... Facing resistance? You know, the interesting thing is that we did face a lot of resistance originally. And I said, you know, we were on this island and now the island has gotten bigger because people are starting to realize, wait a minute, this actually works. <laughs> this, this works better than anything I've taken. And, and the fact is people have to take non, non steroidal anti-inflammatory sometimes in a way that's chronic because of tendonitis or other conditions. And if you take like ibuprofen, aspirin for long periods of time, you begin to degrade the gut. And so now we have many medical professionals saying, wait a minute, this bio BDMC curcuminoid is showing in the results to be working 14 times more effectively than aspirin and ibuprofen. What's the point of breaking down the gut <laughs> using a lot of these other non steroidal anti-inflammatories? So I think people are waking up to the idea and it stems from delivering peer reviewed research that they're able to read and not refute. Mm -hmm. It's back to playing their game. Yeah, and we've published now, you know, 17 peer-reviewed journal papers. You keep, keep in mind the peer review process involves independent medical practitioners and or PhDs that review the technology for the journal and review the paper 
and say, okay, the experimental model is sound, the results are good, the p-values are good. They may even tell us in some cases, hey, wait a minute, we'd like you to do another experiment to validate this result you got over here. Okay, we'll do that. And, and, and this process is, is a spontaneous way to organically drive credibility by independent reviews. You mentioned NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol. Is it Tylenol? Yeah, Tylenol is a different uh, yeah, pharmacology. Okay. Yeah. Um, but let's just take aspirin. Um, a lot of people take that just because it works. And from your perspective, what's the damage that's done when people are taking those? Well, look, you know, I think ibuprofen and aspirin are great drugs taken in small quantities for short periods okay. of time. Um, but the, the one thing we all have to keep in mind, whether it's a pharmaceutical or a nutraceutical, is that we're creating, with these anti-inflammatory activities in these drugs, we're creating the window of opportunity for the body to recover and restore. Because your mind and your body have the built-in programming the genetic programming and energetic programming, however you want to put it, to restore and recover. You just need to empower it and give it the tools and, and inhibit the inhibitions. Like what I, the way I look at a lot of the drugs that we're working with that are naturally oriented is that we are taking compounds going into the genome to release the genes from inhibition and allow them to do their job to recover and restore. And that's one of the biggest problems, methylation that's caused by environmental activity that creates epigenetic activity. You know, what we're doing is countering the epigenetic activity that silences genes mm -hmm. and then countering it with nutraceutical inputs that release the silencing so that they can, they can restore. So the epigenetics is like on top of genetics, right? And how yeah, they, would you explain that to a... Well, the epigenetics is a common term now that's really studied intensely because, um, you know, we can't change the constitution of our genes, our genome, but we can, well, we can now, we're actually we're entering an era where that's possible, but, but let's say we don't want to genomically change our structure, but we can change how our genes work. So our environment influences and modulates genetic activity. And sometimes if that genetic activity is modulated continuously by environmental inputs, even nutritional inputs, then the, the genes begin to morph their activity. Methylation, acetylation will shut down some genes or activate other genes that are needed because of environmental inputs. And this is a coping mechanism. Think about this coping mechanism that was intuitively instilled in my mind originally through bodybuilding. I impose a load on my body. Day in and day out, every day the body says, wait a minute, this is going to happen every day. We need to put more muscle on this guy, on this skeletal uh, 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 tissue, because, because we need to cope. It's a mm -hmm. coping mechanism with the environment. Right. So what you think cold plunge. Cold plunge has all of these beneficial effects in the body that start a genomic cascade with sirtuin proteins and other things, and how... Act, help activate brown fat and other things that happen metabolically. Mm -hmm. Why? That's a coping mechanism that the body instills and initiates based on the cold. Saying, I keep getting exposed to this cold. I need to build a system that protects me from this. And so you have to understand that if your mind has this knowledge to begin with and two, believes in the outcome. And for me, I need the knowledge. I need the science because I need to understand the chemistry, the mechanism. And when I understand it, that instills belief. And that belief then drives the result. What's the difference? I know you mentioned a little bit, but what's the difference between nutraceutical and pharmaceutical? Well, inherently, the nutraceutical is derived from a natural substance, whether it's, you know, a vitamin, a um, an extraction from a nutritional element, a herbal extract. Um, pharmaceuticals are typically are, are typically unnatural compounds that have been um, molecularly shifted, but not always. There are some pharmaceutical drugs that have remained uh, in their natural state. Uh, some of this, some well, let's give an example of statin drugs that mm -hmm. are used to manage cholesterol. They stem from natural compounds you know, from yeast. Right. And, 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 and those yeasts can work as well as statin drugs to manage 
cholesterol and not obliterate cholesterol in fact is critically important for the body for building yes, structure it's nice. and building hormones you know if you eliminate you know cholesterol you're and you're not going to live a healthy life that's why it's in animal products exactly so what are you working on now like what's the vision that you have now well, we've um, we've kind of pushed into an area where we're we're studying lipid metabolism, so the body's ability to metabolize and use fat as a primary energy source. And you've heard of you know the ketogenic diets and uh, ketogenesis, ketosis. Uh, we've extensively studied that to determine how it affects and interacts with brain function. And we've had, I have to tell you, this amazing story uh, because you know it's these these anecdotes that kind of really give life to the science and the yes. research. You can go into a clinical trial that's controlled, but when you see an uncontrolled human struggling, getting results from a substance, then that's a different story. Um, you know, I was in Las Vegas doing business about three weeks ago. My dad had a, a, um, a TIA, which is like a mini stroke. Uh, so it's just a, a very short period of time where there's a um, blood flow limitation to part of the brain. And they didn't quite categorize it as a stroke. But when I went to see him, he couldn't recall his address, his phone number. And, you know, this is, this man is sharp and, and on the ball and, you know, it was devastating, but I brought with me knowing the condition, I brought with me one of our patented ketones. Now this ketone complex called Ketoba is actually the ketone the body makes when you go into ketosis and ketogenesis. So low carb diet, high fat, um, or, or calorie restriction, the body will also make these ketones. And the cool thing is that that ketone will serve as an energy substrate for the brain. And in most cases of injury or aging, we've heard of this disease called type 3 diabetes mm -hmm. versus type 2. Right. Type 2 is insulin resistance of the peripheral tissue, in the peripheral uh, uh, tissues, and, and type 3 is insulin resistance in the brain. And it's highly associated with cognitive deficits, including Alzheimer's. Right. They don't know for sure if it's a causal factor or it's secondary. Nevertheless, you know, when you encounter a brain injury, whether it's a concussion and there's inflammation, glucose transport into the neuron, your ability to actually bring glucose into the neuron for energy declines. And part of it is the inflammation that interferes with insulin function. And so if that happens for a long enough period of time, the neurons will die. If they die, you cannot replace them. But you need to keep them active. And so the interesting thing that happened that I didn't even expect it would happen so fast. You know, we go in, the nurse is there at the hospital. Dad, phone number, can't recall it. Dad, address, can't recall it. Okay, I want you to start taking our Ketoba. In about two or three days, you're probably going to start feeling better because it does help with brain inflammation. And the ketone will enter the cell and be used by the neuron as an energy source, just like glucose, but does not need insulin signaling. So if insulin is not functioning properly, the ketone can still enter and serve the cell. And so the miraculous thing happened right before our eyes. And the nurse was sitting there. Christina was there. And he drank this. And we didn't expect it because I said, a couple of days, you know, give it a couple of days. And um, he turns to us, oh, I know my address, blah, 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 blah. And his birthday. And the nurse said, what just happened? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I didn't expect this to happen so fast, but you know, when you understand the mechanism, this is an energy substrate. So you're talking minutes, five to 10 minutes. That energy substrate is now in the brain and those neurons that were suffocating and couldn't get glucose now have an energy source and they're breathing and now recalling. And if you get that to the brain immediately so that the cells have an energy source, they won't die. And if they don't die, then you retain the memories that could have been lost if they died. And so the interesting thing is I said, okay, dad, you know what, what we're going to do, we got to make sure that this is it. I'm going to call you tomorrow morning because I have to be at the office. I'll call you at eight. Don't take this tomorrow morning until I call you. Call him at eight. Couldn't recall address, birthday. Okay, take it, dad. I'm walking into a meeting. I will call you at nine. So he takes it, call him at nine address, birthday, everything is on, on poor. It's nice. unbelievable. But an example of with knowledge, when you've studied these, these compounds to have the confidence to apply them for the treatment of such conditions that are relatively benign, but if left untreated this way, end up being quite serious as you lose brain tissue. Thank you for sharing that. The, the most interesting thing that I've heard you say yesterday when I was having a private conversation with you was all of this mindset 
we'll call it stuff that you've mentioned already in this in this conversation you were talking about seeing if you could figure out a nutraceutical that can unlock that within the human body to give one the potential of focus and mindset to overcome the challenges yeah and so you know when you understand our model you realize how i think and then how we apply these things when we talk about cold plunge the first thing i do when i understand the biohacking mechanisms i say okay forget the meta metabolic change let's go into the genome and determine what's happening because if we understand what the genome is doing when you immerse yourself in mm -hmm. cold plunge, we can then begin to target the same genomic structures and proteomic structures with natural compounds that do the same thing. And so the reason is, if, if cold plunge is activating a healing mechanism in the body, let's go track it, define it, and see how we can take advantage of a naturally existing, genomically imprinted healing mechanism that's built into all of us. So you could have cold plunge in a bottle. We already have that. What else do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so then I say, okay, we understand that when you work out, the benefits from training and putting load on the muscle are just profound from metabolic to cognitive. It actually helps to improve BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So how does working out result in the release of what are called myokines, muscle proteins, mm -hmm. that end up in the brain and throughout the body to cope. So what it's doing is a saying to the body, man, you're under physical load. We need to superize, supersize yourself. And we send out these myokines, these chemicals, to optimize the brain because there's more going on here than we see physically. So then we say, okay, we know there's a lot of cognitive disorders. We know that people who regularly work out have a reduced risk for Alzheimer's, and it's likely because of BDNF. How do we go in and inspire BDNF transcription in the brain? We've done that too. In a natural way. We've done that. And, and Human Garage is actually launching that product, Curcumero. Amazing. Yeah. Are there less side effects in this natural way? Like you know, generally there are. And, and generally there are only because many of the constituents are derived from things that have been in uh, our, our food sources for millions and thousands of years for sure. And, and so with a lot of the pharmaceuticals, a lot of them are altered chemicals that didn't exist in nature. And so they haven't co-evolved with us. They're kind of a boom, here they are. Mm -hmm. And now the body's saying, wait a minute, how do I use this yeah. now? There's some of them that are spectacular for treating diseases that could have killed somebody somebody in, in, in two days versus now they're, you know, they're still surviving over 13, 15 years down the road. But the, what I say is we need to really begin to change our perspective of those drugs. They are not to be used as crutches, but only as opportunities to open up the windows for healing. There are some diseases where, you know, they're so entwined in, in metabolic and, and genetic mutation that they're hard to completely reverse. Okay. But there are a lot like 80% of, you know, diabetics, 90% of diabetics today, a lifestyle change would shift that and make them healthy. You know, obesity, all these things, a lot of them are lifestyle related and um, few of them are related to mutations. Nevertheless, if we understand how that pharmaceutical drug is flicking a switch to instill recovery and we don't rely on the drug, but rely on the switch, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Right. It's saying, how's the body healing? And let's go deeper to determine that so that we can flick that switch instead of just reducing the inflammation so the body can recover. Let's flick those switches. And that's what I do. You know, when we talk about sirtuine protein activation because of, of, um, of uh, nutritional deficits or caloric restriction, the body will all of a sudden activate a completely new set of genes that begin to do a lot of things, autophagy, which are healthy for us to remove debris and basically just say, okay, we've got to get to the bare bones so that this becomes a lean, efficient machine. How do we flick that switch without oh, starving yourself? Without fasting. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing, fun work. You're having fun with it, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And is there, is there like a, vision in the future 10 20 years down the road like what has like what hasn't manifested yet that you're you're really looking towards 
well, I've got a couple of things that I've got my mind's eye on. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, and, and what I've done is began to split divisions of the company so that we can target those at the same time without intrusion of resources. And so that's part of the planning of, you know, for me, for business, it's like, okay, we're going to now begin to diverge two aspects of the business that I had still and have different teams running um, to target two massive needs that I think humanity needs to strive for. And that's just my opinion. But hopefully I, I meet um, the larger group and consensus at the crossroads because that's where I'm going. And I know that's where, <laughs> that's where humanity needs me. Yeah. Amazing. So is there, if, if you could talk to your, I mean, it sounds like you kind of were in awareness at a young age, but if you could talk to somebody that is set up on a similar path as you, is there any encouraging words? Because it seems like it's, it's really challenging to, you know, you're going to come across hurdles um, but what I'm looking for is we need more people like you. We need more people creating. We need more people on the right side of humanity, you know, having humanity's back. And what is the most helpful thing that you can offer to somebody who who has the skills and, and, and how can we get them moving along? Yeah, I think I think the biggest problem with people being motivated to achieve high levels is is them really finding the right passion because passion is what drives the result you know if you if you drive towards something that you think cognitively you should be achieving you don't have the same fuel the same sticking power when you get challenged if you have something that's you know deeply seated with passion it doesn't matter what gets in front of you you know you're 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 still going right through it obsession yeah and so when you find that groove that's when your life's experience begin to converge um, in an automated way to serve that. If you don't find that, the universe is not serving you towards that goal. And, you know, you can say, okay, well, the universe, what quote unquote, you know, some people say, well, that's fluffy. No, it's not fluffy. You've gone through a human evolution that has taught you to cope based on challenges. Those are lessons. And, you know, like, I tell my kids all the time, those lessons, you've learned them. They're idling. You're not necessarily using them until you find a groove where you're passionate and you're no longer thinking of those resources and tools. They just come spontaneously into play. Mm -hmm. You can maximize and leverage your assets. Yeah. And, you know, I, I use a simple model for that with my son in basketball. This guy, you know, he trains three to five hours a day. And I said, you know, he's 16 and there's sometimes you can tell when he's on the, on the court, like he's a great player. It's unbelievable. This kid, you know, 25, 30 points a game uh, playing, you know, two years up um, and, and um, playing for, you know, the Nike elite youth club that is an invitation tryout only so that, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone into that. But I said to him, you know, all this practice and repetition, taking 700 shots every second day, that repetition, there's going to come a point in time when you are so intuitive and in the groove on the court, you're no longer thinking about how to apply your plays and all this stuff that you are using this way on the court becomes a fluid automated movement. That's con the conduit of which becomes passion. And that's when you're great because fear disappears. Boom. Right. Yeah. And you become one with, uh, with all that you've learned, right? Yeah. Yeah. With the ball, with the hoop, with yourself. Yeah. And that's anything in life, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? Mm. Well, you know, I, I have to say that, I think the biggest part of it is really finding balance between your gut intuition and cognition. It's like, you know, always following your gut guided by cognition. You know, you got to apply a little bit of, you know, log logic mm -hmm. to what your gut is experiencing, but your gut is a beacon for that it, that passion. Yeah. And, you know, use your, use what you know to either pull back or guide that gut feeling, but that gut feeling is where it's all at. Yeah. 
I say I say magic because ma is like the umbilical yeah. cord of logic and magic. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Very good. thank you so much, Franco. I've learned a ton. I'm sure everybody listening to this has learned a ton and we all look forward to seeing more of you. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Till next time.